Welcome to the show, Jennifer Miller. We're here, of course, to talk about your book, Confident Parents, Confident Kids, Raising Emotional Intelligence in Ourselves and Our Kids from Toddlers to Teenagers. And something that I really appreciated is right from the get-go, in the very introduction of your book, you take the time to clarify what confidence is not. And one of the misconceptions addressed in that introduction is that confidence is not, quote, the loudest person in the room. Jennifer, can you say more about why it's important for us to address the question about what what confidence is not? Yes, I, I think it is really important in figuring out what confidence is to define what it's not because there are so many misconceptions about what it is. And I think we we exist in a, a very celebrity-driven culture. Uh, social media is filled with images and voices of, of people that we recognize, uh, whether they're in Hollywood or YouTube fame, whatever. Uh, but we have this celebrity culture that uh, that promotes the loudest person in the room. And the truth is the confidence that I write about that is really important in thinking about who we are as parents, who we are as educators, and how we can support our children becoming confident in who they are is much more about uh, about learning about who they are, expressing who they are, and being confident in their identity and also in how they're coming to understand other people in their skills of empathy and social awareness, perspective taking. Um, so they may not be the loudest person in the room. And in fact, typically confident people do a whole lot of empathetic listening. So uh, so if we're growing confident children, we want them to learn deeply about who they are and how they express themselves and how they learn about others. And, and you really only learn about others by deeply listening. I love that. And, you know, this show tries to advocate for listening skills all the time, we almost feel like they've been, um, you know, they've sort of been given a, a disservice, I think, as you were saying, in the era that we're in where, uh, yes, like, you know, it, it can be, folks can be put on a pedestal too much for just loudness or, you know, over productivity. Um, it's sort of like that age old quality versus quantity thing. So I, I really love that your book invites people to think about redefining confidence for themselves um, and thinking about what confidence actually feels like. Because I know even for myself personally, if I'm in that emotional stage where I feel like I need to be loud and I really take the time to reflect, it's probably not confidence that I am feeling as an emotion, right? There's a proving energy that that is happening when you're trying to be heard, right? You're trying to be the loudest person in the room. You're trying to be the voice over others. There is, I, I have to prove to you that that I'm right, that I'm correct, that I'm the one to be listened to. Whereas I think if we have a, a strong sense of agency, we can we can rest in that we can speak when um when it's meaningful when it's purposeful uh but we can also listen and appreciate and and be open to learning from others yeah and i you know you have me thinking about celeste headley does a lot of research in terms of you know what 
does it mean to actually be a quality, high quality listener? Um, and she talks a lot about how debate almost never changes anyone's mind in the first place. So I think to be a confident leader, um, to be working on your listening skills really makes sense. So I, I again, I, I really appreciate that. Um, your book talks about the reality that emotions are contagious and that families actually can use that to their advantage. Can you share more about the practical advice that you offer to parents and caretakers about shifting the energy in the house? Um, something that I think all families need to maybe think about that as a, a superpower to embrace, perhaps. I, I love this question. And I think um, it, we are keenly aware as parents uh, or caregivers that we can infect the household or our children can be, uh, infect the household with anxiety, with fear, with anger, with hurt, right? The, the, the challenging or threat emotions are ones that we we really feel that sense of contagion that can take over a family and can really take down a day, right? If, if you start off the morning in chaos, uh, it can really impact everyone in the family for the entire day. Uh, so there is that sense I think we all have. We know that emotion is contagious, but being intentional about using that to our advantage as parents, I think is not as typical. So the way that we can utilize it, uh, it is in many ways. How do we talk intentionally about gratitude and what we're grateful for uh, so that gratitude is a feeling and an experience that is a daily part of our family life. Uh, how do we experience the feelings of empathy so that we are seeking to understand each other's feelings and thoughts? We're working on it because empathy is a skill that takes some work and practice. So what what is on her face right now? Can we figure out what's going on? Because that's a complex face. So I'm guessing there's a lot of emotions involved. Uh, so there's another emotion that we can promote the contagion of. I, I uh, just put out an article about sibling kindness. We can cultivate kindness by creating an environment where kindness is spoken of, recognized, practiced. So the idea is what feelings do we want to engender in our family? And then how can we create moments where we embody that and we pass it on. It's it's really that simple, but it takes some thought and intentionality to do it. Well, and I'm wondering, you know, to switch gears from the family space to the educational space, a strategy that I have employed as an educator for a long time is actually thinking about the entry point. Like I usually will always have some kind of music playing as students, or I, I work primarily now with adults, as adults are entering into the space. And I try to think about what's the tone and the energy that I want to set. Like if it's a very serious, like stressful meeting that I know is coming, I'm not going to try to have like stressful, anxiety inducing music. I'm going to have something that's maybe calming or maybe even a little bit playful. Um, if it has been like a really long week and I know that people are tired, I'll try to go for a little bit of, you know, music that's kind of like upbeat and kind of will bring the energy up a little bit. Does that as a strategy kind of like qualify as what you're talking about? Um, like is music almost a shortcut maybe to think about, uh, you know, emotional contagion? It is absolutely a shortcut. And I love that you brought that up. Um, music is the language of the heart. Uh, it is a universal language. We all feel it. And interestingly, it can shift our emotions instantly. 
Uh, and it really, it, it literally, when you walk into a room with music, the air waves change. So we feel it in our bodies. We feel it in our souls, right? It's a whole body experience. So music is a wonderful strategy. And I would expand that to all of the arts. It changes and brings us into, uh, it can bring us into a new feeling space. And, uh, and that can be chaotic, uh, but it also can be calm and peaceful. Uh, it can bring about happiness and joy. Uh, so being intentional about the, the, the art, the music does set a tone in a classroom and uh, in, in a home or family environment. I'm wondering if you have tips or words of advice for listeners who, you know, if we're taking this on board, okay, our emotions are contagious. I don't, if I'm in that state of worry or anxiety, I don't want to be passing that on. But, you know, Jennifer, as you're speaking, I'm realizing there are times that I actually I'm not necessarily aware of I'm feeling anxiety. Maybe I was doing too much doom scrolling in the morning or my coffee was just a little bit too strong. Are there any tips that you have in terms of helping parents, caretakers, educators um, take stock and be aware? Because I think there's a self-awareness piece that almost kind of um, has to happen before we're thinking about, you know, the emotional spread that might be going on. I agree. And it is so true that often when we are starting to spiral into more stress or an anxious feeling, we are not always aware. We're human, right? And we're moving quickly. Our lives are busy. Um, so I think sometimes our children are it can be an accountability in that way. It's students in a classroom or children as as they begin to heighten their uh, anxious behavior, we take a look and say, oh, no, no. I mean, we're, we're the first to look at children's behavior and say, we have got to calm them down. And the truth is, we're feeling it inside ourselves. So I think children can be a, a mirror for us and a good reflection to take stock. Uh, one thing that I do and I'm doing, you can't see it visually because it's a podcast, but I put my hand on my heart frequently and it's just to, to get back into my body and to feel my heartbeat. And uh, again, it's, it's getting back into my body to sense it, am I at a heightened uh, anxious rate or a, am I feeling calm? And if I am more anxious, I know I need to step away. Uh, and for people, either educators in a, a early childhood classroom or caregivers with young children, we can't step away. Uh, we have to be present in the room, but it is possible to go within ourselves and calm down. So I often encourage educators and caregivers to close your eyes in the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. Even if it's chaotic, you can close your eyes, you can hold your heart, you can you can put your hand on your wrist and, and try and feel your heartbeat and begin to connect with what's going on inside and calm it down before you return to outside. And believe it or not, that's a twofer because children take notice. They watch and the feeling that you are emitting is instantly contagious. So you can feel good about the fact that you're teaching while you are taking that reflective moment to calm down. What you just explained has me thinking about you know, an, another level that I appreciated your book for. And that's that, while social emotional learning, of course, is, I think, extremely well known in the realm of K-12 education. Parents and caretakers, you know, many are of a generation where this was not a factor, right? So the strategies that you're talking about, you know, I'll speak for myself, like I never encounter, encountered that in my own, um, you know, primary, middle or high school education. And there is this real need, I think, for parents and caretakers to also have this upskilling of some things that 
yes, it's it's just sort of like a very simple thing that you can do. I love the hand on the heart. Another one that I learned was if you're having a difficult conversation, try to focus on your feet flat on the ground and your back pressed up against the chair. Just the physicality of that is a nice reframe and refocus in is a lot of the response to your book and your work. Like, are you finding that parents and caretakers are saying in some ways, you know, my child is learning this skill and I need to catch up a little bit. Has that kind of been some of the response to your research and work? Absolutely. And I think, um, I, I think one reaction is, oh my goodness, I'm not a perfect parent. And there's kind of this guilt, like <laughs> I, I, I could, there's always more to learn. There's always more to do. Um, and, and kind of a feeling of I, I'm not enough. And, and really that is not the point we are. N- there is no such thing as a perfect parent, but if we look through the lens of a, of development, which happens at the child level, and we tend to forget that adults are in a developmental process too. So, oh, by the way, we're developing as adults. If we look through the lens of social and emotional development, we are learning these skills for a lifetime. We are always working on redefining our identity, whether it's the identity of being in my 30s or being in my 50s now, right? Uh, So we are always redefining who we are and how we understand and relate to others, and then how we make responsible decisions considering all those things. They're they're some of the hardest skills in the world, in our lifetime. So the, the great news about this is no, our parents didn't know about this and, and they couldn't be intentional because they didn't have many educators who were talking about this, if any. But now we have the science, we have the understanding that if we look through the developmental lens, we can use our challenges with our children, with our students as an opportunity to ask what does this moment offer me in building a social emotional skill in the student? And what is this moment an opportunity for me to hone a skill in myself? So it changes the dynamic instead of a, a victim blame kind of dynamic. Instead, it is we are all learning. We are all able to thrive by taking a look at what we're learning and building on that each time we meet a a challenge or a milestone. I agree with everything that you are saying. I have been a big believer in how important this is for a long time. You know, you have me thinking back to, I know many educators are in the practice of having, you know, either quarterly or termly or end of year surveys with students. I one year asked my graduating seniors, and I had taught them for two years in a row, I said, what is one small thing that I did or didn't do that you think had big impact in you know, our time together? And what was really interesting is one of my students um, really took the time to write out their response to saying, you know, at the start of every lesson, you were present. Like you kind of seemed like you were in a good mood and I know it's impossible that everybody's in a good mood every single day, but that really meant a lot to me. And that is something I try to do intentionally, right? Like when folks are coming into the space, I don't want to be on my phone or on my device. I probably have 10,000 things that I could or should be doing, but I feel like that quick moment of connection and presence signifies like, literally I'm here for you. And I was really happy to hear that student say, that mattered. However, I have on occasion had, uh, you know, a parent sort of mention, you know, the social emotional intelligence stuff, emotional literacy. I feel like it's taking away from academics. And, you know, of course, there's so much research out there that says the exact opposite, demonstrates how these things are interwoven, you know, like we need psychological safety in order to learn. But nonetheless, there are 
still skeptics. There were skeptics a decade ago, and I think there will continue to be skeptics. I'm really happy that a book like yours exists because I think it's it's an incredibly accessible book, right? So it's one I would be recommending to that parent caretaker audience. And I'm wondering if you have some additional advice for educators who will inevitably be confronted by the, I'd call them like the emotional intelligence skeptic. Um, and they, you know, use language like, I just want to get back to the academics. Um, what do you think is maybe kind of a, a compelling approach to helping support that person in understanding why this does matter and why this is, in fact, I would say, still focusing on academics? It is a reasonable challenge. And uh, I have been in this field for 30 years, and I have heard that challenge from teachers just as much as I've heard it from parents. And when you're looking at um, a, a, an academic competency like learning to read, we know that there are 45 minutes of instructional time every day devoted to just the task of learning to read. And we understand that social and emotional skill building and social emotional learning as a classroom climate tool is more complex. The reason is we don't leave our hearts at the school building door. They come right in the door with the students, right? And their brains sit there along with their hearts uh, and their whole beings. And so if we expect them to leave their hearts at the door, they're gonna struggle. So the we are educating the emotions. We are educating students' hearts when we're talking about reading, when we're doing a math lesson, when we are doing any academic content, we are educating their hearts as well. And if we're not intentional about it, we're going to teach them poorly because we're going to teach them that anxiety should not be shown. It should be suppressed for six hours a day. Uh, somehow our young children are supposed to do that. And then if they feel great, powerful passion and joy for a subject, that's supposed to be suppressed too. So there is an education of the emotions that happens in our classrooms, regardless of whether teachers are intentional or not, regardless of whether families are intentional or not. But if we become intentional about simultaneously educating their minds and hearts, then, then not only are they learning in a deeper way, but they're also preparing for those critical life skills that they will use always. So it is a false choice to say academics versus social emotional learning, but Again, it's it's a reasonable challenge. And we as educators and as parents who believe in and understand how it works have a responsibility to define it and get really clear about how we're integrating it so that parents and educators are comfortable with the fact that it's integrated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I love the idea of it being a false choice to begin with. Um, your book stresses the importance of normalizing discussions about emotions. So again, that child is talking about this at school, at home, the idea that I can bring up how I'm feeling, that's not place dependent. And you mentioned how important it is, especially for teens, that we also talk, uh, this is kind of like a direct quote from your book, when they are ready. Can you say more about those two pieces of advice, the idea of normalizing conversations about emotions and then conversations with teens in the time that they would like? Yeah, in our busy lives, that can be a real challenge. But I, I really appreciate that you brought up presence earlier. Uh, presence looks differently at each age and stage. And so in the teenage years, our teenagers 
uh, they, they're in this push me, pull you mode where they, they need their independence. And sometimes we may be hurt by that. And sometimes we also may feel like we're not as important or influential yet parents, caregivers, educators are absolutely essential influencers in teens' lives. And research has shown that time and again. But we know that that, that some of their disclosure of who they are becoming has to happen on their terms. If they're going to develop that sense of identity and agency in a safe environment, if we don't look for opportunities when they're ready to communicate about deeper issues, we will miss that opportunity and they'll go to others. And sometimes that means they go to their peers and sometimes their peers won't give them the kind of nourishing, safe support that they need. Maybe they will, but it's it's rolling the dice in some ways. So I, I think it's interesting that teens are learning to drive at the same time that they are facing all these vulnerabilities and really defining who they are going to be as an emerging adult. Uh, I think it's a perfect opportunity because you don't have to look it eyeball to eyeball. There is an opening up that happens in the car that doesn't seem to happen other places. So I, I really look at, at, at the car ride as a magical time where teens will open up. Now, educators don't get that opportunity as often, but they do have the opportunity to walk down the hall, to have sidebar conversations. It's in those moments when adults show they're fully present, they're really interested, but not pelting, right, with questions, but they're genuinely interested and and they're ready to listen. Their phones are down, their defenses are down, and they're not looking for a gotcha, you know, I'm catching you doing something bad, but they're really curious, genuinely curious about what's going on inside uh, the teen's mind. I want to touch on you mentioning the idea of question pelting, because this is a practice that I see happen a lot, I think, especially with folks who maybe don't get a lot of time with teens, um, where, yeah, they will keep doing that, like, question asking, and th the teen is letting you know, right? Like, their body language is very clear. What they're literally saying or not saying is very clear in that, like, now's not the time that I want to have that conversation and you're actually making my defenses go up even stronger, right? Like the more forceful you try, the more of a shutdown there might be. Um, and I'm wondering if you might just talk a little bit about, you know, something that I really love about working with teens is that if you are patient and you show that you're respecting their time and their space, if there's a, a hard or a so-called difficult conversation that needs to happen, if you give them a little grace, again, they'll come back, you can continue the conversation. But you know, what you were saying earlier about social media, and I think a false sense of urgency that we have, you know, must fix it in this moment. I, you know, life doesn't work that way. And I think when we grant one another patience, it's a currency. Do you want to say more to uh, you know, folks who maybe have made that mistake, you know, they're hearing us talk about the pelting or the peppering of questions and they're thinking, my gosh, I do that all the time. What is a different communication strategy that you might offer them to try out next time? Well, I want to underscore your phrase, patience is a currency. Wow. And I will say when I ask parents what they need most, it's it, patience is at the top of the list. So if we think about it from a social emotional perspective, self-management skills are the ones that we need most when we are working with teens, uh, again, because they they need to be vulnerable on their time frame. And um, it, yet we who love our teens, who care about their success and have 
deep feelings about our, our passions for their success um, tend to want to pelt them with questions because we're, we're deeply interested, right? So it comes from a very honest place. Um, but I also, I think we have to remember their vulnerability and, uh, and remember that we're going to scare them away if we, and we are not going to get to the, the key information that we're looking for. Uh, so I, I, I constantly remind myself, uh, and, and it is a record that plays in my head. He is a teenager or she is a teenager. They are going through a lot. Step back, stand back, stand back. You're, you're so fortunate to be a part of this show that is uh, an amazing, unique time of life. The other thing that I remind myself is that it is so brief. I have a sophomore in high school. It is going like lightning fast. So I don't have that many windows of opportunity. So that's not to put the pressure on, but it's to say, because this is precious and sacred, I need to use every skill I have to be patient, to step back, to get quiet, to be present, again, to put my device away and pay attention when I can, while I can so that they're ready to bring the, the issues that are plaguing their heart when they're when they feel safe enough to do it. Mm. That piece about how quickly that time goes, I think is really critical, you know, and I, I think it's just great life advice. I think sometimes to step back and ask like, what is it that we want to focus on right now, given the understanding that time is quick. Um, and I, I think the other piece that I have found when working with teenagers is once you almost feel like you've stepped into that zone where you're trying to win, you've already lost. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I really appreciate your book because I think, you know, when you're an educator, you do want to work in partnership with parents, care caretakers and students. It's really important. But I have always found when I have my teacher hat on, there's kind of a boundary and it can be difficult for me to try to veer into offering parenting advice. And that's where I feel like schools that have book displays for parents and caretakers, there's real power in that because um, for a lot of adult learners, I think it's sort of like if I have chosen to take this advice on, it's I'm going to get much further than somebody has said, hey, you know what you need to know, but almost, you know, the book has kind of Put it in, in that space. If you've got a parent caretaker lounge on your campus, have some copies in there. Um, and for schools who are hearing our conversation and they're thinking confident parents, confident kids, great book for a parent caretaker book group. Is there a question that you're hoping that specific audience, um, you know, if they're going to meet and parents are going to be talking about the book over coffee, uh, is there a kind of a big umbrella question that you would hope they would make sure to discuss in their book group? Yes, I, that, I love that question. And so my big question for, for parents and educators is how are we coming to understand the students whose lives we want to impact together how are we coming to understand their social and emotional development at their particular ages and stages and ways in which we can promote that social and emotional development? Because teachers do not typically get trained in educating for social and emotional development, unfortunately, and that's starting to change, but teachers are not prepared typically as educators, but also as humans. We, none of us get training in how to do this business, right? It, and it is the stuff of life. So we are both learning. How can we learn together to support the same student? And how can we begin to share language and share strategies and share challenges I'm working on this at home. What are you working on at school? So that we can both be reinforcing everybody's working on empathy, everybody. 
And our child's going to feel that and they're going to experience that in the classroom in a different way that the, than they're going to experience that in their neighborhood. Uh, so I think that's the question. And I think if teachers experience the fact that parents have a lot of knowledge to provide around social emotional development. And obviously teachers have a lot of knowledge they can provide around that area. Then there's a shared agenda for learning. Oh, I love that. Shared agenda for learning. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show, talking about your book. I know that folks will be wondering, okay, if we would like to have uh, Jennifer Miller come and, and chat with our community, uh, you know, maybe as a follow-up to reading the book in community, what is the best way for them to reach out and potentially learn further with you? Yeah, so check out my site, confidentparentsconfidentkids.org. There are tons of free resources tools on it and all my contact information is there. I do book clubs with schools and districts. I do online courses and and I speak. So I am happy to support schools and districts efforts to partner with families around this learning. Great. Well, I will make sure, again, all that information is in the show notes. Thank you again for your time. Um, and you had mentioned briefly your research that you're doing on siblings. Where might folks find that when that, that's uh, released? Yes, confidentparentsconfidentkids.org. It, it, everything that I release is, is on there. And there is a review of the research on there. So you can find everything on my website. Great. Fantastic. Thank you again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.